30 seconds of intros. Priorities. Yeah, let's do 30 seconds of intros. I was going to just say, it's, uh, it looks like the topic shifting priorities and changing environments. Is that what you guys saw too? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, which could mean I anything. His, I have right. it in, in front of me. So. Uh, okay, do you want to, should we do 30 seconds of intros? Would that be helpful to all the entrepreneurs in the room? Claire, do you want to, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to chat. Kevin, love your background. Um, <laughs> I'm Claire Fouquier. I'm at Highland Capital Partners. Um, we're a 33-year-old fund based across the U.S. with offices in Boston, New York, San Francisco, and Palo Alto. Uh, we do predominantly Series A and B investing with initial check sizes between 5 and $20 million. Um, and I'm based in New York and started our office here relatively recently, uh, about a year ago or so. Um, so I'm Don Stalter. I'm with Global Founders Capital. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco, but I uh, spent a lot of time in New York and in LA. And, um, you know, we're a billion two global fund that was started uh, about four years ago. Uh, we do a lot of really early stage investments across consumer, software, hardware, um, healthcare, uh, and biotech. Great. I'm Shripriya Mahesh. I'm with Sparrow Ventures. We're a $100 million fund. Um, I started my career in uh, Silicon Valley in 99, primarily been in product and product marketing roles. I ran global product at eBay for a number of years, uh, moved to New York to go to film school and then moved back to Silicon Valley. Um, I was, I've been institutionally investing since 2015, started at a mid-year network and then we spun out Sparrow Ventures. So we're a single LP fund. Um, Pierre Midiar is our only LP. And Claire, I moved to um, San Francisco because of Highland, because of a Highland investment. Steve Herrick was a section mate of mine and Joe Tango was investing in NextGuard. So That's I'm, awesome. It's yeah, amazing so how, how wide the tentacles are of the Highland alum network. Yeah, yeah. So Steve and I were just catching up and he said, hey, you've been doing, sadly, uh, credit card <laughs> consulting. Do you want to help us? diligence this investment we're looking at and i said yeah and i met the people and i was like okay i'm gonna move up so it was great good um so how should we do this i'm personally at least looking at the spreadsheet we have of everybody here and we have a bit of background on everybody um maybe you guys sorry go ahead sorry go ahead maybe people I was gonna say, jump in with questions sorry sorry i'll let you no. know <laughs> Zoom is terrible for all this. But yeah, we can we can just jump in with questions if everybody wants to do that. I think we sort of have, at least I took a run through what everybody's building. So I think we can probably, given we don't have a ton of time, just jump right in. Should we be raising our hand or do you want to, should we just go? Because I, I have a question for the group. Um, you're just, just I'm, yeah, okay. I'm Amanda. Um, just quick i am working on a women's health company we are re-engineering it's a team of mechanical engineers re-engineering women's health products starting with the tampon um i think my question from the like a consumer products perspective is that it's we're all very aware that retail is obviously very affected by the shelter in place and the lockdowns um, I know that just before this period, there was kind of a bias away from direct to consumer because women, I mean, just consumers in general, were still going to retail locations to buy like commodity like products like a tampon. Um, how do you foresee those trends shifting even outside of the lockdown periods and the shelter in place? Because um, we kind of went from like, Direct to consumer is amazing. Now we're kind of going back to retail. Now we're kind of in this weird period. What do you see uh, kind of after this and moving forward? Um, I'll jump in. I think that um, there's some really interesting sort of tailwinds that have happened in consumer. We sort of went through the period where D to C startups were valued like software startups and that sort of come crashing down regardless of COVID. Like I think we saw that with the Casper IPO and obviously Blue Apron and various other examples. 
my opinion on this and what I thought for six months and I think is solidifying more and more now is that I don't think D2C is going away. I think in fact, COVID is showing us that people want to shop local and want to have a connection to brands and sort of buy aspirational products. But I think that, and by the way, there have been successful consumer brands built over decades, right? But I think what changes a little bit is the expectation on valuation and the expectation on exit. I think we're starting to realize that just because you can pump $50 million into a DTC brand doesn't mean you can get the exponential growth like you can in software because software is just inherently built to scale really quickly. And so I think my take would be if I were a DTC founder now is be incredibly cash efficient. Think about unit economic profitability raise as little as possible while still hitting growth targets. And I think those types of metrics and showing um, efficiency with a really organic uh, customer base, I think is a successful raise. It just probably doesn't mean a raise of four years ago. Yeah, maybe to kind of add to kind of what Claire mentioned there, for us, it's all about getting to scale organically. It's about growth hacking and figuring out you know, who your influences or influencers are, you know, sort of, what your product should sort of look and feel like so that people, so it's a pull function, people just want it um, as, as sort of the premise. So it's like product first kind of thing. Um, I think the other thing that I might add is that, uh, yeah, so, I mean, any, any of these sort of direct consumer businesses or marketplaces, you know, you got your supply side, you got your demand side, you know, on, on your supply side, you know, how efficient is your supply chain? Are you, are you quote unquote vertically integrated? You know, are you repackaging kind of existing products? I mean, I think there are a lot of solutions on the supply side, but I think making sure that, you know, um, you, you, you get your unit economics down pat on, on, on that side of things is really important. And then I think on your demand side, um, you know, on your, your, the market that you're attacking, um, I think it's really important to have conviction that the market's big um, and that it's not, that there aren't too many players out there, you know, trying to acquire the same customers. I think the other kind of final thing in terms of capital raising, um, you know, if you like given potentially the outcomes are not as massive as, as one might think, uh, there's no harm in, you know, if, you, if you're able to get the right unit economics in place, there's no harm in raising uh, venture debt, you know, so you don't experience you know, the dilution that you would um, at you know, raising, at a, raising equity at a lower valuation than, um, than you formerly sort of would have. That's actually a really good point. And I'll just put in a little plug for one of our portfolio companies, ClearBank, um, which is a way to fund digital spend. There might be some creative ways to think about digital spend now, given that prices have come down without having to think about adding dilution. The only thing I'd add is I would think through how consumer behavior has changed you know, um, not only through COVID, but how it's going to change going forward. I think, you know, we're going to be in a, in a world where social distancing or like every business, every retailer is going to change how they have to do business. Offices have, have to change how they do work. And if you think about it as 18 months before we get back to what used to be normal, I would think about what could you do to stand out in that environment, right? Like, could you, what could you do to, allow consumers to try your product without the risk of not having seen it or held it. Um, and perhaps not being able to for 18 months, right? How, what would you do differently in that world? But I think otherwise, Claire and Donald have covered most of the VC stuff. Thank you, that was super helpful. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Rudd Taylor. I'm at Object Limited. Uh, we're building the world's premier fashion resale markets. Um, we've been around for about a year. Uh, we're a pre-seed company. Question for everybody. We have seen, I'm curious to hear how everybody's, uh, everybody's reaction to the kind of sectors that you're investing in has changed since COVID. Seems like there are some kind of clear winners and losers. Winners are, delivery companies and work from home companies and things like that. Losers might be retail or, uh, or office space leasing or other things like that. Any kind of surprising changes in how you've kind of viewed the, the sectors that you're investing in since COVID has come up? Uh, 
Okay, I'll jump in. Um, in in terms of sectors, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, before I think we even dive into how we view the sectors that we're investing in, we're trying to be a bit patient and listen because it seems like we've all been working at home for a century, but it's been like five weeks or something. And so we have no idea what's going to happen. Um, I was speaking to a pretty thoughtful investor friend of mine who said something like, anybody who is going to be relying on the playbook of you know the last cycle is probably incredibly naive because this is just so unique and you know fortune will favor those that are really listening to the signals in this cycle um and i don't know if that's necessarily true or not i think the point is we just don't know i think it is easy to start pointing a lens at some of the obvious examples like um digital uh, education digital health the ways that things are adapting and i think there's people on every spectrum saying that you know telemedicine is the future no one will ever go to a doctor's office ever again and then there's people that are saying that you know telemedicine is a, a blip so who knows for me i'm still thinking about some of the themes that i was already thinking about before and trying to take a, a broader macro lens to them and think about sort of all the spectrum of risks that things could persist and what we think sort of is fluid enough to be adaptable enough to the new world and so for instance, one theme I was really thinking about the last six months that I've continued to push on is um, e-com enablement. So the, the pipes behind e-com in a really broad swath. And right now I'm sort of doubling down on that because I don't think e-com goes away in any means. I think to a certain degree, some subsectors have taken a dip, but I still think that online purchasing is an incredibly strong tailwind with or without COVID. And I think now could be an interesting time to pay attention to it, especially with volumes down and really good businesses that need to be funded to sort of weather some of this stuff. So I'd say my sort of view is, and I might be totally different from everyone else, but my view is sort of to be patient, think about the founders that are sort of adaptable and thinking about sort of, you know, the flexibilities of their business models to, to pressure test from all directions and paying attention to the signals um, that they're seeing because they're the ones that are sort of touching the market more than I am. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's similar when, you know, I don't know what you guys are seeing, but we've seen an increase in deal flow just as people are starting to worry about not being able to raise over the summer, they, you know, kind of pull in their raises. And, you know, the things that we're thinking of is, even if it's a company that's not directly affected, we're thinking of things like, can they last till, the, till early 2021 for their next raise if, if we fund them now? And will they be at a point where they can raise their next round with good numbers, right? Like if they're going to raise a series B, will they have the revenue and the growth that will get them there? Um, and, you know, because with venture, one of the things you think about is not just, is this a good investment, but like two years from now or 18 months from now, who's going to like fund this company again? And will they be at a stage where they can be funded again? So that's something to think about when you are, when you are raising either now or in the future is everyone's thinking about who the next founder will be and what the metrics will be at the next stage. And it never always, it never goes to plan. You know, there's always like a roller coaster, but it's something to think about because coming out of it, the world in 2021, it's two years from now, the world will look very different from what it does right now. And who knows what the requirements will be to raise your next round. So we don't know that yet. Speaking on that point, um, how have milestones changed since all this happened? Because I think six weeks ago, we were looking at doing a fall raise with some pretty aggressive milestones and essentially getting down to, you know, 90, 100 days worth of uh, money in the bank at the time that we were doing our fundraising. And obviously, that's changed quite a bit. And I think for us, uh, Kevin at Qualitative Health, we're building a marketplace of health coaches. Um, trying to understand a how this has impacted short-term revenue but also like what we thought we needed to raise a seed um, is just not going to happen now and so figuring out how to uh, maybe change the goalposts in terms of milestones um i can kind of speak for us i mean i think um you know milestones and um business models uh, aside, there's still 
there's still appetite for a variety of funds to make investments off the back of a really great um, founder and, you know, the ability to articulate a big vision. Um, and you, know, you can have milestones that you're delineating in kind of your narrative. Um, I think um, at the same time, you know, really sort of, you know, pe people talk about this a lot, but just having kind of momentum within your network, within the market, um, kind of, you know, being able to d describe sort of an eye-opening dis disruptive opportunity is one that, um, that compels investors to invest. And there's definitely a certain level of kind of slowdown. I, I think there's like a Forbes article talking about how, uh, you know, sort of seed investments, um, the, the pace on them had been sort of halved or something like that in the past month and a half, two months, whatever it is. But if you look at, you know, probably the half, um, the, the, the half seed deals that have been funded, um, you know, uh, I, I bet 50% of those were off the back of a great narrative um, rather than off the back of specific milestones. And maybe I'm just speaking for kind of myself and how I look at the world, but um, you know, I would, I would definitely have those milestones in mind, but I would have kind of, especially at the pre-seed, seed, whatever else, the, the bigger vision and our, your articulation of the vision and, you know, what you're going to do to get there, um, what resources you're going to pull into place, uh, your ability, you know, articulate your ability to pull those resources together. Um, you know, and the question around, um, you know, sort of how big the round needs to be and all that other stuff, like the, those will all, that, that'll fall into place. I think like I think that's all accurate. I think the one other thing is that I think cash management becomes um, a concern as well. And specifically, I think there's going to be a little bit more analysis into uses of proceeds, how capital efficient, how reliable sort of the the understanding of the business model is to be able to sort of flex up or flex down accordingly. I think we were in an era where it was sort of believed that a bigger balance sheet meant faster growth. And I think now there will be some skepticism with that. Um, and so that, that might be sort of where things change a little bit from a metrics perspective as well. And just to follow up on that, um, I mean, if we take the example of Uber, like them reaching break even on a per ride basis, the expectation is that happens like in a B round as opposed to a D round type thing, like the you expect us to move uh, to break even sooner. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily break even sooner, but it's like how can you get your unit economics to make sense, and how can you? Um, so there are two things, right? Like one, can you convince people that it's going to be a really big business at scale? So that's the first question. Like when you get to scale, can you be a really good business? And have you figured out unit economics earlier rather than later? Because if your unit economics are not figured out earlier, then you're gonna keep needing more and more money as you grow. So the sooner you figure out your unit economics, the better off you'll be and the easier it'll be for you to raise money. I mean, I think you know the last 12 years is like the, the largest expansion. I mean, the longest expansion ever. And there was a belief that like, it will just keep going and that's just not true, right? And it, it, we came into this world where it's like, just grow and there are bigger and bigger funds that will keep funding. And, and you know, I, I've had conversations with what I consider growth funds who said to me, we're not really doing growth anymore. And I was like, wait, what? Um, you know, and so people are just waiting and watching and at the earliest levels, I don't think you'll be that affected. But what I'd say is at the seed and pre-seed levels, like the hit will be like at the companies right, right now who are gonna to have to raise a C or a D in the next 24 months, right? Like I think that will be much harder than raising a seed or a pre-seed. But for the seed or the pre-seed levels, you still have to have your unit economics that makes sense and figure out a way that every raise will last you 18 to 24 months. I would say closer to 24 months if you can. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I think the concept of growth at all at, at any cost is sort of out the window and the thinking now might be, again, might be, we're five weeks into this, um, might be how do we think about really viable exits in three to 
seven years instead of no problem, there's capital in the private markets for 15 years. Um, and so that question comes up of how can we reach profitability earlier? How can we extend runway for 24 months while having, you know, measured growth as opposed to just, I think there was a lot of disregard to unit economics to just juice top line at any cost. And I, I don't think that's the environment that we're going to be in. Yeah. And I, I also say, um, you know, the types of business models that people are evaluating um, has, uh, the types of business models have changed a little bit. I think, you know, off the back of, uh, you know, some of the technology enabled services businesses out there, you know, similar to kind of direct to consumer business models out there uh, that have commanded kind of software multiples um, uh, and have now sort of been marked to market to a certain degree. Um, uh, investors are evaluating whether a model is, is highly scalable or not, or whether, you know, there's more kind of elbow grease and manual work uh, that goes into kind of the, the execution on the operational side. Um, you know, the uh, kind of attributes that we're looking for now, I think um, are, you know, is it sort of a great founding team that can articulate a vision and pull the resources together kind of towards their North Star, kind of first and foremost, always. Uh, second, is the model, uh, one that's highly scalable, um, or is it like do things that don't scale until you hit kind of that that point in time? Um, uh, you know, and do things that don't scale until you hit that point in time when it does scale um, is probably less uh, less relevant kind of to this market. Um, you know, kind of in a um, previous world, it was it was sort of you know try different things out until you uh, kind of hit that inflection point, and then you know maybe maybe more money goes in, but but I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's kind of what we're, what we're seeing now. And then sort of thirdly, um, I'd say um, kind of vis-a-vis -vis the COVID environment or whatever else, I mean, people are being thoughtful around models themselves. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, call it, um, you know, any, anything that's impacted kind of the travel category, call it offline, um, call it, you know, restaurants, et cetera, um, are, are harder to sort of, you know, wrap our heads around. Next question. Anyone else? Um, I'll ask a question. Uh, hi, Calvin Smith, uh, CEO of Hired Llama, where we focus on re remote recruitment services, uh, a remote recruitment uh, platform out of South America. Uh, focusing on experienced software developers. Um, Pre-COVID, we saw a lot of people looking mostly for employment, even though they were remote. I'm just wondering, out of what you've seen from the people that you've talked to, are they still focused on the remote uh, employment services, or are they more open to other options after uh, what's happening now? So I think remote is going, I mean, every company is now remote, right? Like we're all remote. And I think uh, remote will be more of the norm than the exception. And I think people were going remote before, our companies at least were going remote before for cost reasons, right? Because San Francisco and, and New York are just so expensive. But um, I think remote now will be even more acceptable because what's hard about remote is when there's an office and some people are remote, right? So it makes the remote people, it makes it really hard for the remote people. But if everyone is remote, then everyone, the, the whole organization figures out coping mechanisms. So my sense is that we will go more remote. People will get, you know, um, money or like a welcome bonus or whatever to make sure their set home setup works. And, um, you know, like offices, I think real estate is going to take the biggest hit because I think a lot of people will consider not having offices. Um, so I think remote hiring and remote work and hiring people you haven't seen, we've already seen all, almost all of our companies have someone remote. 
but I think that's just going to accelerate. I wanted to kind of um, maybe reframe some of the stuff that I just said and, and sort of um, on, uh, talk about remote uh, for a second also. I think that, um, you know, some of these impacted categories, um, like to the extent there's an interesting angle on them, um, you know, maybe a remote angle, for example, um, like maybe you've seen um, Airbnb do sort of virtual experiences, um, uh, you know, virtual tourism, et cetera, um, is sort of becoming a thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you add a bit of, you know, the remote ingredient to kind of a lot of these different models, uh, you know, they, they turn into something somewhat compelling. I think there's a thesis out there that um, the fact, you know, we're doing Zooms all day long right now, we're being remote all day long right now, um, that people are being trained uh, to do things remotely more frequently. And, um, you know, there's going to be a longer term kind of shift to remote. Um, off the back of some of this stuff. I mean, I think that, you know, off the back of kind of Zoom and everything else, Slack, uh, you know, uh, their IPOs, their popularity, uh, you know, remote had already kind of become a thing. Uh, but, you know, it's, you know, certainly kind of accelerated, um, uh, you know, on the cheap without significant, you know, marketing budget uh, because of the coronavirus. Does more remote change how you think about like a full-time employee with stock versus contractors? I mean, uh, I mean, I think maybe the, there was sort of the perception that uh, contractors uh, kind of are, are meant to be remote uh, prior to kind of this whole uh, global pandemic. I think, you know, maybe, uh, that perceptional shift kind of uh, even more now and, and you know, full-time people uh, are just as viable being remote as well as in an office. Um, but I think, I mean, uh, maintaining sort of a remote workforce, uh, especially if you're kind of a heavily operational business, can be a bit of a challenge. And so there are a lot of different tools that are being built as workarounds uh, on the HR side, you know, um, on you know, the KPI management and metrics management side of things. And uh, so I think that, you know, market, uh, as it becomes sort of, uh, you know, more and more prominent, uh, will lead to, uh, call it more uh, responsible kind of full-time remote workers. I'd say that I don't think it should change whether you view full-time and giving people equity or not, because at the end of the day, you still want to create a company culture. And if contractors are cycling in and out, it becomes very hard to do that, right? And if you think about it from the contractor perspective, a part of their brain will always be on what's their next game if they have to go look for that versus if they're full time and they're just invested in your company and they're sitting there and they know they're secure or more secure, you know, as secure as one can be in this environment, um, you're going to get more of their brain, more of their dedication, more of them thinking about ideas for work when they're like, you know, like jogging or in the shower or something, you know, like how your brain works versus thinking about what their next job is. So I think, I think um, you should continue to do what's right for the business in terms of like, hey, if this role is part time and that's what it requires and it's a, it's a gig that you have to, like it's a, it's a task that has to be completed and the best person is a contractor, that's what you should do. But if it's a long-term hire, I don't think remote should change how you, treat the employees necessarily in terms of equity. Yeah, there's a platform, just so you guys know, to plug one of our companies um, called Deal. It's D-E-E-L. And uh, they do payments and benefits and the whole kind of gamut for remote, primarily sort of full-time folks. Uh, take a look at it. So there, there's sort of a wave of, uh, call it picks and shovels emerging uh, to enable the full-time side of things. Do you think about giving companies less money because they don't need rent money? You know, uh, that usually doesn't come into the calculus for us, but I don't know. I'd be curious to know what everyone else thinks. It's too new yet. You know, like we haven't yet seen a company where they're like, oh, we got rid of our office entirely. But if that's true, then it will just be baked into what they are raising. So, and we'd look at like where 
all the, the spend is going, but we don't necessarily think of it as, oh, they need less because of rent, because usually rent is not, depending on how, how big they are. At our stage, rent is not like their biggest, not a huge cost at like the series, like late C, early A. I'd be more confer concerned on the flip side if a seed stage company thought that the amount of rent would impact the amount of race. Um, just given that like there's ways to be a little bit more thrifty with rent at the beginning and I think it scales with the size of the company. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, things to, I think things to watch really are um, uh, hiring and just ensuring that you have kind of the best people on board who are maybe multifunctional and can wear kind of multiple hats as kind of the old saying goes. Um, I think, uh, you know, contemplating how your unit economics can be uh, positive. I think, you know, that's kind of the, the other thing. Yeah, actually, Don, you just kind of brought up an interesting point. Like, I guess one of the worries could be to your earlier question, Kevin, is like, if people are becoming remote workers and therefore there's much more flexible payroll or whatever it is, one of the worries could be that then you end up hiring more people less thoughtfully because you're sort of stretching your budget a little bit further. And I don't think that's necessarily the right approach to things. I think some of the comments that were made on this point around making sure you have the right team that's, you know, compensated accordingly so that they're bought in and excited about the future of the company and building the right culture, that's sort of always going to be paramount. It's not necessarily about making every last dollar stretch as far as possible. It's about being, you know, efficient with your time and growth and with the money that's in the bank. I think every investor funds with a buffer because, you know, it's never a straight line. And so, you know, like a little tweak, like an extra month of rent or something, if that's what's throwing off the entire company, that's, it's been underfunded. These are good questions. I feel like we're all sort of like figuring out this new normal together and it's hard to, you know, project what the fundraising environment will look like in October. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd be curious to know what you guys think. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're not inside of the companies necessarily. Um, you, you're inside them kind of full on all the time. So, you know, we don't have much time, but we'd be curious about your points. They're forcing us to switch rooms. Yeah, I just saw that too. <laughs> oh. well, I, I can answer. You came at the wrong time. Um, yeah, I can answer really quickly. I think we, we've been a remote first team since inception. And my biggest concern has been kind of the anxiety and mental health of our team and like keeping that in mind and trying to like make them feel comfortable with this new reality, but then also keeping them optimistic um, and motivated given the level of uncertainty with the company. So, I mean, for us internally, it's like, you know, how do we keep everybody aligned and kind of mentally strong throughout all of this? And I think that's something that most startups are going through. I know we have like eight seconds or something, but how are you doing that? Uh, Sorry, we literally have two seconds. 